Good afternoon. My name is Anna Maria Gelagos, and I'm from the Ford Foundation in New York. And I am very happy to be here with you today at the joint, Harvard Joint Center release of the 2016 State of the Nation's Housing Report here at the National Press Club in Washington, DC. So as any, many of you know, because we wait for this time every year, um, this report provides us with empirical evidence and great analytical tools to understand what the state of our nation's housing is. This year, I think it's a little bit of a double-edged sword um, because yes, the, rec the housing market is slowly recovering, but there are issues. There's issues that we need to pay attention to. Too many of our Americans are far too cost burdened. This is worrisome. It's worrisome because it's happening in both the rental market and in the home ownership market. It's also worrisome because it's, in, it's happening um, to, uh, it's resulting in dislocations, evictions, and too many things like concentrated poverty and um, uh, racial disparities are increasing. So we at Ford are very concerned about this and we're looking forward to this conversation today to see how we can engage, how we can refine. This report um, is been, I think published since 1988, correct? And uh, we at Ford are very proud to be able to have been supporting it for a very long time. We use the results uh, that come out of this report and we refine our uh, policies. For example, we used to focus really very much on asset building, on home ownership. Now we're looking at more balanced uh, policy around uh, rental, around the whole systems around and continue and, um, and delivery systems so that more people can benefit. And um, we hope that policymakers like you are also able to participate and to use um, the findings um, we are excited because um, we have a terrific lineup and um, we have uh, Diana Olick from CNBC who is here to uh, moderate our conversation. And so I turn it over to her who will uh, lead us on the day. Yes. Great, thank you so much. Thanks, Anna. First, I'd like to... Uh... I'd like to start by introducing our esteemed panel. I'll start to the left, a man who needs no introduction, but I will anyway, is Chris Herbert, Managing Director of Harvard's Joint Center for Housing Study, and one of the lead authors of this report that we're reading today, The State of the Nation's Housing. Uh, next to him, Mayor Satie Warren of Newton, Massachusetts. He's also Chairman of the Community Development and Housing Committee of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Diana Yentel, Diane Yentel, President and CEO of the National Low Income Housing Coalition, and Stuart Miller, who is the CEO of Miami-based Lennar, a home builder there, one of the nation's largest home builders. And I would personally like to start with a bit of news, because that's what I do for a living. Uh, this morning, the National Association of Realtors reported that the median price of an existing home sold in May was $239,700. That is a new record. That is the highest median home price that the realtors have reported since 1968 when they started reporting this number. And the realtor's chief economist said he was now flashing yellow lights on affordability. Because while we are in a housing recovery, we are coming up against very difficult affordability issues, and that's part of what we're going to discuss here. And I'd like to start, actually, with Chris, since it's your report, you get to go first. Um, we are not recovered. You can't say that. We still have over 4 million borrowers who are underwater on their mortgages. We still have uh, people who are struggling to make down payments. We have very high home prices. But we've been tracking your report steadily through this recovery. Where are we now in 2016 in the state of the recovery? And what's the headline that we should be watching this year in that state? Um, so the state of the recovery is making steady progress, I would say. We've known for the last few years that we're not expecting to see this thing take off like a hockey stick. Uh, but last year, I think we really solidified a lot of gains. Um, the rental sector, multifamily housing in particular, has been strong since 2010. And we saw last year was steady improvement in the single family side as well. So as you mentioned, the, the, the headwinds we'll st we still face in terms of uh, hangover foreclosures and underwater borrowers are there, but we're just making steady progress on those fronts. The numbers we watch are twofold. One is what's happening with household formation. That the big part of the reason why the, house, the housing recovery has lagged is because we haven't been forming households. Much of it has been young people not moving out of their parents' basements. Um, and so we're looking at that number as a key driver, and that number has been going up. 
Um, and I think it's not so much because people are moving out of their basements. Pew just reported last week that they're still there, but that they're starting to turn 30. As millennials turn 30, they in fact do launch on their own. And so that's helping to drive household formation. And the other key measure I would say on the demand side is incomes. And now that we're at full employment, we're seeing income growth, particularly among those young households, which I think is gonna help fuel more demand for both renter and owner-occupied housing. And yet we're seeing trouble still in the rental market when we talk about affordability. And if I could, I'd like to put up slide number three, or figure number three up there, uh, because rental affordability has been terrible. Tell us why. We look at, uh, at, at um, occupancy in rentals. Why are rents still continuing to climb, even though we're seeing more volume in rental construction? You know, I think it's a, it is a partly a fundamental question of supply and demand. And even though supply is in way up, we built uh, 400,000 multifamily units last year, most of them for the rental market, more than we built since the late 1980s. We also saw more than a million new renter households. So as much as we're building new housing, we're, have, we're struggling to keep up with the pace of demand. Um, and the other part of it is the affordability story is partly about supply, but it's also about incomes. And I, you know, one of the things we've seen through this recovery has been weak income growth. And so as much as the affordability issues reflect uh, a very tight rental market with rents going up, it's also been weak income growth, particularly at the bottom of the income spectrum that's been behind it. And I would just encourage all of our panelists that as I will ask you lots of questions, but if you would like to respond directly and converse to each other, that's fantastic as well. Because I'm going to jump right across the pond over there because we're talking about rental affordability. We're talking about construction and housing. Stuart Miller, you um, made a bold move into multifamily during the recession as other home builders were struggling and housing starts dropped dramatically. You moved your company into building multifamily. How did that play out, and why is so much of the multifamily on the high end? Why aren't you building more affordable housing? So we made a significant move into multifamily. Uh, today we have about a $7 billion pipeline of built and being built uh, product across the country. Uh, that went from zero seven years ago to now a $7 billion portfolio. Uh, we made that significant move in anticipation of what we thought would be a tepid recovery in the context of a severe downturn that uh, kind of cast a dark shadow over housing, home ownership in general, um, and a very restrictive mortgage business or mortgage market. Uh, we felt that many would have to reveal or form their households and migrate into uh, rental product as opposed to being able or enabled to migrate into for sale products. So we we felt that there would be a trend. We also felt that given the production deficit that had been built up during the downturn, that both for sale and for rent product um, would do well in the ensuing years. Uh, in fact, for sale has lagged. For rent has um, really bolted forward. Uh, and if you look at the uh, report that's just come out, um, uh, we're, we're developing rental at about 400,000 right now, which is at historical highs. Uh, but we've also had this major shift of single family foreclosed homes that have been repurposed as rentals. And so the stock of dwellings for rentals has materially shifted over the past years. So our call was right. It's been a good move for the company. We're still primarily a for sale builder, and we do quite well in that core market as well. Why has it been more towards the high end? It's simply not feasible, financially feasible, to build at the lower end. Um, uh, if you look at the regulations at the local levels, the zoning regulations, together with impact fees and other costs associated uh, with building affordable housing, uh, we've migrated to an environment where local regulations, local restrictions, um, have made land costs uh, and land development costs so expensive that the numbers just don't pencil out for that low-end renter. And I'd like to transition, if you want to add to that. I'd like to add to that, just say that um, the other factor is that we have very strong growth in high-income renters. 
And so it's one thing we haven't seen in a generation. So it, certainly the development pressures may push the, the builders there, but they're also finding a ready market for this. We had an increase of 1.6 million over the last decade and renters making more than $100,000. That's downsizing baby boomers? Or? It's, um, well, I think it's across the spectrum. It's, uh, it's a lot of, it's college educated young people. Um, it's some downsizing baby boomers. When you look at where the growth in renter households has come, it's come, it's not one demographic, it's a lot. But so I think the supply side affects it, but it's also, there's a strong demand for these apartments. So that's partly of fueling the high end as well. But, but also think about the fact that you've seen household, or, or um, home ownership rates drop from what, 68, 69% down to 63.7%, which is at kind of a, an historic low. Um, each 1% of reduction of home ownership is 1.1 million families that migrate into for rent product. A, num a big portion of that were people who could afford to buy a home. They are employed, they have the capital, they've been disenfranchised because they're in the penalty box either through foreclosure or bankruptcy or some other format, they have to rent. So that high-end rental market has really been flush with new entrants. So Diane, this year's report states that the state and local efforts to expand the supply of affordable housing for rentals, it's not meeting the existing needs. What should we be seeing more on that state and local level? Well, I think at the state and lo local level, we're seeing um, localities and, and, and governments really stepping up to the extent that they can um, by reducing regulatory barriers or increasing resources. But ultimately, I think the point that, that you make is, is a good one, is that um, the feas financial feasibility of creating affordable homes for extremely low-income people, you know, and at the National Income Housing Coalition, we focus on families, for example, a family of four who's earning $20,000 a year. And as we, we're seeing in the report, you know, many of them, most of them are severely cost burdened. So they're paying more than half of their $20,000 a year towards their rent. And if I could tell you, could we put up figure four because that speaks to what she's discussing on lowest income renters uh, being the most cost burdened. Yeah, and then they have very little left over, right, for all of the other kind of costs of life. Um, so. What we need in order to make it feasible to create homes or create affordability for these lowest income renters is a significant investment from the federal government. The, the states and local governments can step up and are to the extent that they can. We should look for opportunities to leverage private dollars when we can, um, but ultimately this problem, especially for the lowest income people, won't be solved without additional federal resources. So, Mayor Warren, what do you see as the most common strategies being used on the state and local level? Well, first of all, I want to compliment uh, the work done on this report. I think it's outstanding. One of the things that I think it highlights is this issue of income inequality in all of our cities and towns across America. Um, when we looked at the report, myself and our staff, it's clear that people's incomes are not keeping up with the price of taking care of themselves and their children and their families as far as housing, uh, transportation costs, medical costs. Uh, there's a real divide that's growing. When you talk about the market that's growing for folks that want to rent, uh, own condos and homes, you're talking about a uh, percentage of Americans that have done really well through this recovery. Housing prices continue to, to go up, which is a good indicator of economic growth. On the other hand, you're seeing this divide. I think the strategies are threefold, and I think it starts with investing in human capital, people, and infrastructure. And I think it needs to be done at the federal level, state level, and city level. So there are three points I, I want to make. First of all, um, and you are absolutely correct, at the federal level, uh, we've cut programs like CDBG and HOME. 50% uh, cut in the HOME program since 2010. Uh, I, one of the things I, uh, roles I play as uh, chairman of Community Development House of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, uh, we're just asking to get to $1.2 uh, billion at, at home. That's been cut. Uh, CDBG funds continue to be cut as well. Uh, we're asking for $3.3 billion. That's still not enough, but we, we at least want to level fund ourselves for the next year. We need to make sure we make those investments at the federal level. The second thing, um, at the state uh, level, one of the things that the state of Massachusetts has put forth uh, in the Senate is a zoning reform bill uh, that addresses some of the things that you're talking about, allowing for accessory apartments, for example, to increase the uh, number of units in cities, uh, 
making sure that cities have inclusionary zoning percentages, meaning there's a percentage required uh, for building of affordable units. We have that in Newton. Um, so there are things we can do, law changes at the state level that we can make. The third point I, I want to point out, um, and, and I'm using Massachusetts as an example, 34% of children that live in Massachusetts live in cost burden households, which means they're spending, those households are spending um, over 30% of their income on housing. 34%, that's an extraordinary number, and it goes beyond the households you're talking about at $25,000 a year or $20,000 a year. That tells us that we have to take a comprehensive approach to this issue in addition to building more affordable units, uh, making them accessible, and middle income units, we have to combine that with creating uh, jobs at wages uh, where people can earn an income to afford to make the rent and purchase homes. It means investment in things like job training and real education opportunities. Um, and it also, makes, it also means investment in transportation. Many of the housing options that we've seen built um, over the last decades have been built in areas that are not accessible to jobs, not accessible to daycare. Uh, daycare, for example, and when we look at this uh, comprehensively, is one of the largest cost drivers for our household right now, um, and so are energy costs. So one of the things I think we need to do in addition to investment um, in, in, in uh, physical capital is investment in people um, and look at these issues comprehensively. Uh, the Jobs Plus program, for example, at HUD um, in, in their updated uh, program in, in the recent uh, year has granted uh, cities uh, money to take a comprehensive approach for people in public housing. That would include job training opportunities, coaching, and also wraparound services so that people can attain self-sufficiently and they can get to a point where they can earn um, an income, where they can afford to be self-sustaining again, possibly uh, find a home. We'll see, we'll measure the metrics on those and see how we do, uh, but we've got to be much more comprehensive at the local level, state level, and federal level if we're going to address this. And I'd like to bounce off that with you because Harvard did a deep dive on the segregation and the growing segregation. If I could put up slide number uh, 36, can you talk to us more about what you found in this growing um, concentration of poverty affected by housing? Yeah, you know, one of the issues that uh, social science research over the last year or two has really been uh, developing an accumulated body of evidence of how important it is about where people live, where they grow up. Uh, what they found is that people who grow up in areas of concentrated poverty, this is researchers from Harvard, Roz Chetty and, and Nathan Hendren, have found that the impact on their lifetime earnings is substantial. Um, there's issues around uh, health outcomes, educational outcomes and the like. And so how the housing market and how assisted housing policy is playing into where people live and how we separate by income is really important. What we found is both in some of our own analysis and this slide shows work done by Sean Reardon and others at Stanford, we go back to 1970 and say how, did we, how were we divided economically as a country? At that point, 65% roughly of households lived in middle income neighborhoods, middle, between 80 and 125% of area median income, with less than a fifth in each of the, the extremes, low income and high income. Fast forward to 2010, it's now 40% of people living in middle income neighborhoods and 30% each living in high and low income areas. If you look at the concentration of poverty, just since 2000, the number of people living in neighborhoods where the poverty rate is 40% or higher has doubled from 6.5 million to 13.7 million. To Mayor Warren's point, a lot of those are children and the kind of impacts on children are significant. So when we think about housing policy, we have to think about how does both market rate housing and assisted housing play out spatially because where you live really determines a lot of your opportunities. Well, obviously all real estate is local. Um, is there Stuart, is there a role for the big builders in building affordable housing, or is this just not an area that, that major publicly traded companies can be in, given the bottom line? Well, look, realistically, the larger builders are focused on building that which generates some form of feasibility from a financial standpoint. We are profit-driven. So to the extent that there's a profit motive that's satisfied, there can be a role for the bigger builders. But the argument that I would make listening to the conversation here is what is missing from the overall program is a comprehen comprehensive housing strategy. If we had thought about housing comprehensively in the wake of the big downturn, the, the Great Recession, I don't think we would have constructed a result 
where hedge funds were buying distressed homes and renting them back to lower and middle income people. Um, a comprehensive housing policy recognizing the importance of stability in housing for the average American family, the ability to locate, to not have to move, to not be um, rent or, or housing cost impaired in their ability to live their lives is a really important American value. It's an important American driver for families to be able to raise their children uh, to get to the next generation and to do better. Um, and I think that we've missed the opportunity over the past years to have that comprehensive discussion. It's not just low end, it's all the way through the spectrum. Um, and in that regard, the big builders can and should play an important role, but it is gonna have to be at least somewhat profit driven. And that's why you got, in a very small way, into the single family rent. You're building single family rentals now. Now these are, what's the price point that we're looking at here? Is Would you say it's, a, it's not a low income? It's not low end. At all? No. Um, but is that something that could be a model, perhaps, of getting new single family rentals to keep people in neighborhoods? Or is that not a model that would really work for low income renters? It's a complicated model. It's not one that has yet resonated with lenders and therefore actually finding the capital for that product uh, is a little bit complicated. So uh, while we've experimented with that, uh, that product type, it's not one that's enabling us to bring single family product to market that is truly affordable. We actually thought at the front end it would be more that way. Um, the complexity around financial feasibility at the low end and even for the middle to low end very complicated in today's world, and a lot, of the, a lot of the discussion revolves around land costs and development costs that are severely impacted by zoning laws, and I don't think that the answer is inclusive zoning or uh, it, 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 it's a drop in the bucket relative to the need. Um, I think it's more, it's bigger than that, Please, and go we're going to have to find some answers uh, that go beyond the scope of just inclusive zoning. Can I, can I Please. respond to that? Um, so, I recognize three or four years ago, Newton is a, a suburb of Boston, 88,000 people. Um, I think we're the poster child when you think about income inequality. A lot of great wealth, small pockets, very small pockets of poverty. And a, frankly, um, if we continue to do nothing in the city of Newton, we're losing our middle, middle class. And that's what's going on in Boston, greater Boston area. Um, one of the things I recognized was that we needed a proactive housing strategy. Um, we needed to identify policies uh, that, that frankly comported with the region because a lot of my residents live in, in uh, Newton, uh, work in Boston, work in the surrounding community. Uh, so we're releasing that tomorrow on the, uh, right after your report. Um, and what we do there is not just promote, uh, we already have inclusionary zoning, uh, that we're taking a look at raising from 15% to 20% or higher. But we're also looking at areas where we could do mixed use development. And we've identified those. Um, there are 70 areas we identified in the city of Newton uh, for choices. We look forward to partnering with uh, developers in some cases that are already in process and looking at developing housing um, in some areas where we can do housing. To your point, uh, the answer cannot just be an inclusionary zoning law because that is just a drop in the bucket. We need a comprehensive strategy that addresses diverse housing, seniors, middle income, and affordable units. Uh, seven, we've identified seven areas in Newton to start with in the next two years that will generate at least 800 units. So I am a proponent of a broader strategy in, in addition to uh, supporting some laws and investment that will make that happen. I'll report back to you and everyone and let you know how it turns out in the next year or two. Um, I'm hopeful that we can work together as a community to get there. So I think we can do both. I guess that's my answer and, uh, and think what, regionally what, as what well. Many are, like, give sorry. Diane a chance. She has that. For a second and just, um, I just want to point out that, of course, there are uh, programs that work to create affordable housing uh, for the lowest income people and to increase housing affordability for them as well. You mentioned HOME and CDBG, those are important programs. 
Um, the National Housing Trust Fund is one that was um, just recently funded this year. It's the first year that it's up and running. It's dedicated entirely to creating um, new homes affordable to the lowest income people. But what are the numbers? What is the cost to the federal government? You, you've got numbers. Right, so, so, but, so there's that program, there's the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, which is also a really successful program. It creates about 100,000 units of affordable homes each year. Um, it tends to, to focus its affordability on families that make about 50 or 60 uh, percent of area median income and with additional subsidies can target uh, more deeply than that. The Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program is a really important tool for um, increasing affordable housing for, for residents. So the problem is not that we don't have solutions, right? It's that we're not funding these solutions at the scale necessary to meet the need. And I think when it comes to looking at, you know, what kind of investment, this is a, this is a multi-billion dollar problem, right? And the solutions would cost about as much. Um, I think when we look at to your point of needing a, a, a comprehensive housing policy, I think that's absolutely right. And when we look at how are we spending housing dollars in this country today, we're actually spending about $200 billion a year um, to help Americans buy and rent their homes. And the bulk of those subsidies, about three quarters of that, goes to subsidize higher income homeowners through tax benefits like the mortgage interest deduction and others. So there's a quarter of those subsidies left to assist the lowest income renters, those that have the clearest and the greatest need. So I think when we talk about um, the scale of investment needed to solve the problems, um, we also need to look at where can, that, where can those funds come from. And the good news is that we can actually solve much of this problem without spending any more money as a country. We just need to spend it more effectively and look at how do we target limited resources towards those with the greatest need. But just to go back to the point about the private sector and their role in this, and I think there is a spectrum, and I think obviously we have a strong need for affordable housing where subsidies are needed, but there's obviously most of the housing we're going to build is going to be built by the private sector without subsidies. And so I think to Stuart's point, you know, how do we give the power of that industry to produce more middle income housing as well? And it goes back to how much land is zoned and available, what the process is for that, what other regulatory barriers there are. Now, I, I realize that regulations have a purpose. There's important environmental goals, there's other goals in terms of funding public infrastructure and the like. But I think we really need to look at these with the eye of saying, if our goal is to make sure there's housing across the income spectrum, making sure that those structures are allowing industry to build housing at different price points. And one of the things we're seeing now is that the numbers of homes being built less than 1,800 square feet is, is way down from what it was. And it, that, that's the segment of the market that hasn't rebounded. Part of that is demand, but part of that may be this kind of each time we go through a building cycle, we ratchet up the, the regulatory regimes that make it more difficult to build cheaper housing. So that's one point. And I just want to echo the need to, to have a national housing policy that really becomes a kind of north star that for how do we uh, aim as a country towards achieving our goals. You know, the 1949 Housing Act set the goal of a decent home and a suitable living environment for all. I think we ought to think about what those goals should be nowadays and have another renewed commitment as a country to try to achieve that. Well, you've all talked a lot about needing housing policy, but we also need to look at the financing behind it. We've talked a lot about supply, demand, construction, zoning, areas, regulation. We've, we don't have a banker here on the panel. Um, if I could put up figure 19, it's on the home ownership rate. We have seen home ownership drop to the lowest level in over 50 years. And if you look at that rate, which is around you can see it over there. It's actually lower because if you take the four and a half million people who are underwater on their mortgages and you consider that they don't actually own their homes, your home ownership rate is even lower. And a lot of economists are predicting that the home ownership rate will continue to dip, even though it's flattened a little bit now. Um, when we look at the mortgage market and we look at mortgage financing policy, we talk about an overall housing policy. Right. But we have to revamp our mortgage system. And there have been all these stories we've been doing lately on CNBC about the return of the low down payment loan, the return of you know, maybe some of the non-documentation loans. We definitely don't want to get back to where we were in the, in the height of the housing boom, which caused a crash. But mortgage lending needs to loosen up a little bit to get those first time buyers back into the market. Is this? You know, do we need to get the financing policy before we get the rest of the policy that you all are talking about? I would give that to anyone. 
So we have a uh, large mortgage company as well. So maybe I go. can play Thank banker you. in the room. <laughs> And, uh, and all the nonprofit people have been egging me on anyway with the mortgage interest deduction and you know, some other things. So um, <laughs> all of this fits into the category of comprehensive housing policy. The mortgage question is a critical question. I mean, if you really look at that graph and you look at home ownership rates and where they've come, who's missing from the home ownership picture? It's the first time buyer. It's the lowest end of the spectrum that typically has led housing out of a downturn, but it's really not shown up. It's really been disabled by a mortgage policy uh, that, that has been very restrictive, highly restrictive. And today, if we want to bring back that lower end, I dare say we have to start thinking about subprime lending. And nobody wants to say those words. But the fact is, call it what you want, it's still trending back towards enabling a lower down payment and enabling people at the lower end of the income spectrum to be able to afford if we want to go that direction. So my argument is that we've got to develop, we've got to politicize a real discussion around what our housing policies are. And I would make, um, on Chris's behalf, the argument that the work that the the Joint Center for Housing does at Harvard, um, as one of the key participants in this discussion, is critical because they study in an unbiased way the facts, the figures, the information that should be driving housing policy. It's not the low end, it's not the high end, it's the whole program of what are we thinking about housing and how do we stabilize housing for families? How do we enable the appropriate level of participation in home ownership? How do we incent the proper participation in rentership? How do we create stability in our housing stock and make it work for our economy? This is a big discussion. It starts with facts and figures, and I think Chris does a great job of creating that starting point. But our politicians have to start talking about it because it is the elephant in the room. And it's not, it's not generating that income participation or that GDP participation that housing generally brings to an active recovery. And I would add that we are at 30% in the recent report this morning, 30% first-time home buyers, and historically we should have 40% as the share of the market for first-time home buyers. But obviously Congress is not going to touch any of this until we have a new president. Once we get there, we have not only issues of housing finance policy, we have FHA, which was designed for the first time home buyer with a 3.5% down payment loan, has become onerous to lenders now because FHA and government go after lenders for even the smallest mistakes on any mortgages in the underwriting. So what is, I mean, do, Mayor Warren, do we want the, the subprime borrower back? I want to go back to um, what I was talking about a little earlier about looking at this comprehensively. One of the things we're looking at doing, and I've uh, put some policy get together around economic mobility from the Brookings Institution for Newton and discuss it nationally, is, is looking at what it really takes to be self-sustaining in a city, what that income level is. We're, for example, in Newton, are going to put together that range, that number. I think that's important to start with because as we focus on lending practice, the amount someone would have to put down uh, for a down payment, which is, which is extraordinary, we also have to look at what's going on with that individual. One of the things that your report pointed out are things like student loans that are burdening people right now. The monthly payment for student loans, people that uh, have taken out an enormous amount of debt, um, is staggering in, in today, right now. And I, as your report points out, could be contributing towards uh, the lack of opportunity to put down payments for uh, first-time buyers. Um, so I, I do think that, as opposed to just looking at the housing policy, we've got to look at this broadly, as your report sort of hints at. And I think it does start with looking at the real, you know, what does it really mean to live in one of these cities and, and afford to pay the rent, afford to put a down payment, pay the mortgage, afford for daycare if you have children, afford transportation, afford uh, basic living expenses. 
I think we need to look at this comprehensively first, and then we can then make some decisions around the lending policy. But when we look at this chart, is this all about affordability, or is this, again, about that shift in whether or not younger, first-time potential buyers really want to become homeowners, or if we could get the rents down a little bit, they might not just want to stay renters, because that's a, that, it's not an affordability issue, it's a lifestyle issue. Well, I would say that the shift that we're seeing here is not one factor, it's many factors. Um, uh, certainly, the fact that we had more than 9 million homes lost to forfeiture between foreclosures, deed and lose, and short sales is a big uh, source of decline, and that's ongoing. So part of the fact the homeownership rate is still coming down is the fact that that's still a leaky bucket. We're still losing twice the, the number of homeowners a year that we did before the crash. Um, it's also related to demand side factors. If we, you know, we, we talk about trends in incomes. If you look at incomes of young households, they've been trending down, now starting to go back up. So there's demand side factors there as well. I mean, I think the credit issue is an important one. There's no doubt that getting a mortgage is now harder than it was, particularly if you don't have pristine credit, than it was before the crash. And you, you asked, so should we have, go back to subprime borrowers? I just want to make a distinction between borrowers and loans. And I think, you know, I would argue that a lot of the pro problem we had was with loan products. And so when you say that we're going back to low down payment loans and low dock loans, low down payment loans don't give me pause, low dock loans give me a lot of pause. Because not documenting your income and not having the ability to afford that mortgage is a big problem. But I think there's lots of people who have less than pristine credit scores who can be successful homeowners with the right mortgage product and with the right preparation. And so I think we do need to think about, if we want to have an entry level first time buyer program, think about housing counseling, getting people to understand their finances. Think about savings incentives. So get people to save that down payment which the down payment itself, I think, in terms of skin of the game, is not as important as it is the kind of budgeting and financial management that you did to get that down payment that will help you out as you become a homeowner. So I think we have room to expand that credit box safely if we have the right mortgage products and the right supports for homeowners. Yeah, but you, just, I hate to jump in here, and caveat, but recognize from the standpoint of the lender, there are the ability to repay rules and some of the other pitfalls in the regulatory environment that are impediments to actually doing rational lending in any kind of a subprime way. And as you properly say, Chris, there, there's no question that there are, uh, there are lower income borrowers who can be vibrant and, and uh, perfect homeowners um, if we enable them through the mortgage market, but the mortgage market as it's con currently configured is a treacherous ground for most lenders. And sitting out on the horizon it are questions like GSE reform, how do we reconfigure? If you look at and, and listen to uh, some of the public officials, they're talking about we want lower down payment loans, we want um, uh, lower credit scores, and yet at the same time, those are the same groups that are going after for technical deficiencies in loans, going after the lenders that have made some of those loans. So it's a, it's a really difficult environment, and that's why I get back to that question of housing policy. What's the goal? What's the aim? And making sure that you're on track and your strategy matches the tools and implementations that you have in the uh, system. And you also have to make sure that once you get those lower income borrowers into home ownership, that there is housing stock for them to purchase. I mean, the lower end of the market, the under, when we're sitting here in Washington, we tend to think of a house priced under $100,000 doesn't exist. Well, maybe it doesn't exist in the district, but it exists in much of America because that median price is still in the 200s. Um, the only drop in sales we saw in May was in that category because there is so little supply. And if I could just have figure eight, please. Um, home construction is ramping up, but not on the low end. Now, uh, DR Horton, Lennar, and KB do have entry level products. It's a small section of your uh, everything goes with it, it's called the uh, everything's, everything's included. included. Thank Sorry, you. everything included. It's about 30% um, of our product, Delphine. right? Yeah. So it, it's, a, it's not the bulk of it, but the builders tend to shy away, as you've said multiple times, because you just can't afford the margins, don't allow for you to build lower priced homes. If so, we can get the land at the right price, meaning the zoning. It's not going to be in the right location the, the, that people well, want. But if we can get the land at the right price, and if we can, uh, with the uh, impact fees in check, so the costs of development are not overburdening uh, the financial picture, and if the buyers, the demand is actually there, the 
the for-profit builders are going to be participants, active participants here. Remember, normalized production is a million and a half a year. Uh, normalized production in order to find equilibrium needs to go to about a million seven, million eight for at least a couple of years. We're five, six hundred thousand homes short of that. And the home builders can be an active part of that machine if the machine is enabled, but it requires a buyer who can get a mortgage paying a price that rationalizes the land and development costs. And on the existing side, you still have a lot of investors who ate up all that low-priced inventory, all those foreclosures, distressed homes, millions of them. And you know, a lot of people thought, well, they're going to buy and sell when the prices goes up. They're buying and holding because the rental paradigm is really working for them. They have set up management structure. Um, I'm curious to know from you know either Mayor Warren or Diane, how you see the single family existing rental owned by investors as playing into that policy to get affordable rentals. I, so the single family home playing a part in the affordable rental market. Uh, look, I think one of the things that I think as a mayor we need to think about is taking ourselves out of the sort of normal boxes of single family homes or for for families uh, only and looking at these some of these single family homes and allowing for multifamily units and dwellings to occur. Uh, one of the things that uh, on the state level that's being promoted and certainly for me is allowing for that in certain cases, certain areas of the city by right so that that can, that can happen. Um, I think that that certainly plays a huge part. Newton, for example, um, close to 90% of our housing stock is sing single family homes. And the uh, How much of that median, is rental? I was about to say, the, so uh, I'll get to that. And so it's a very low number. But the, but the sales price for those homes, median sales price, is $1.1 million as of 2016. We're a suburb of Boston. Um, we, on our side, we have a different challenge, right? We have to open up the market. We have to build more. We have to create more density. We have to allow for, for single multifamily dwellings in certain of our neighborhoods. I mentioned accessory housing as one of the options, but we've, we've got to do that, Newton, if we're, going to, if we're going to increase the stock. In other places in and around Massachusetts, there's a different challenge. They are not as close to industry, available jobs that are high paying, and transportation systems. They have a different problem. They've got to actually stimulate job market, economic development, so as you say, there are people that can actually pay market rate units as well as affordable units. So uh, that's why I say we have to look at this comprehensively. There's no one-size-fits-all policy uh, for places like Newton versus New Bedford or Lawrence, um, or even going out west to Greenfield or Springfield. Uh, we have to look at it comprehensively, and we have to look at the income level. We have to look at transportation, as I said, education, job training, altogether, and economic development, what's driving the economy. I agree, and I think that um, you know, single-family homes as, as rental units is innovative and creative, and that's what we have to be in order to find the solutions to solve this problem. Uh, one, of the, one of the issues that's raised there and one of the things we should be thinking about as we look to that as a solution is um, protecting tenants of those single-family homes if the owner is foreclosed upon. And something that we saw that happened after the crash was that there were a lot of low-income tenants living in those homes. They were paying their rent each month um, without knowing that their, the owner of the home was in trouble, ultimately got foreclosed, and they were evicted. So there were a number of um, protections. There was a, a law called Protecting Tenants Under in Foreclosure Act that created some protections for those um, for those residents to make sure that they didn't lose their home through no fault of their own, and we need to continue to think about those kind of protections. Okay. Um, we only have 15 minutes left, so I'd like to open up to the floor. If you'd like to come up to a microphone on either side and either direct to anyone specifically or to everyone. Is the mic not on? Sorry about that. 
Um, disability is not brought, we don't talk to disability community about trying to own homes because of what you were just talking about, um, being in that income network. You know, being on SSI, there's no way you can barely afford to pay your rent, rather, I mean, let alone uh, save. So I just want to bring one, today is the um, 17th anniversary of the Olmstead Act, which is to get people out of institutions and into the community. We need housing for that. So and, is there a question for Yeah, you? I'm just saying, and then the second is um, about accessibility, having houses that are accessible to people with disability, the whole visibility um, concept, and where does this fit in, and where does that community fit in about employment and all those other things, but the, the housing market is not accessible. Um, these one family housing markets you have have stairs um, and also it's also for the aging so where is the people with disabilities at in this conversation I think that's a great question Dara thank you and a great point um, as she mentioned you know folks who are who are severely disabled and um, surviving uh, with SSI benefits can afford a rent each month of about two hundred and twenty dollars a month so clearly there's there's um, assistance needed there and I think the report showed that less than 1% of new units being built are accessible, and, and clearly we need to do better. Um, your other point about what this means for uh, seniors, which of course that population is, is growing um, at a rapid rate, and we're not equipped, and our housing stock is not equipped either for affordability or accessibility for those seniors or disabled folks, and we need to do better. And I, I'm really glad that you that you brought that up because we had not mentioned people with disabilities and there's a wide range of disability uh, that's out there. Um, I talked about this housing strategy we're putting forth and part of our housing strategy is to create diversity in our stock uh, for people with all different types of disabilities as well as people who are growing and aging in place. In our city, in our region, we have projected through our demographics report, that's a part of our strategy, a huge growth of people um, at or above the retirement level age. And I, I know that's reflected in your report as well. Um, and our city has, is not prepared for that right now uh, as far as housing stock. But beyond that, I know I'm, I, I feel like I'm a, a broken record here, uh, looking at the services, transportation that needs to wrap around uh, that um, accessible sidewalks, accessible trans transportation, uh, the types of uh, human services that are needed. So we're visioning that um, out 10 to 25 years. It's going to be a lot of work, I, and I also don't mean to hit, beat a dead drum here, but it's, this, is gonna, this is where you talk about investment. Um, we have a blueprint. We're going to need state partners and federal partners to implement that. And I bring up the home funds, I bring up the CDBG funds. Uh, these are the types of programs and beyond that we're going to need to invest to make, these, make this happen. If we're going to partner with a private investor or a nonprofit, we're going to create a group home. We have a number of them in Newton. We need to expand that. If we're going to create senior housing, if we're going to actually renovate maybe some of the houses that, we, that exist now uh, with home funds or CDBG funds for folks that are living there that want to stay there. A lot of our seniors want to stay there to make it accessible. Our streets, our sidewalks, we need that investment. So the Fed, federal government uh, does need to partner with us here and, and increase uh, the, the investment that they've made if we're going to get there. I'm David Jeffers. I'm executive vice president at the Council of Federal Home Loan Banks. And um, uh, the federal home loan banks are privately owned uh, cooperatives that uh, um, provide reliable liquidity for their members to support housing finance and uh, community investment. Uh, I'm here as a metaphor for today, as a metaphor for the state of housing, so still standing, but, but somewhat hobbled. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and my question does go to what, what all of you have been um, um, suggesting, the need for not only housing finance reform, but a comprehensive housing policy. And uh, most people here in DC uh, agree that that's not gonna really get going for uh, at least uh, a year. Uh, Michael Stegman today in an interview in Bloomberg when he was announcing his uh, move over to the Bipartisan Policy Center said it won't be a first year uh, 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 priority. So we're, we might be looking at 2018. Uh, and things like the Joint Center's report and others are laying groundwork for it not only being, once it gets underway, it not only being a housing finance GSE reform, but like you're implying very strongly, 
uh, comprehensive housing. Uh, my question is sort of where does the political will come from? In other words, you, you lay out very well in this uh, a policy uh, environment or, or the issues that if you were a member of Congress you're, and you were a statesman-like or a stateswoman-like person, uh, you would respond to these issues uh, on a policy level. But where's the political will come from? In other words, when the, who's going to be calling as a voter, as a consumer, uh, emails, text, uh, tweets to directly to the members of Congress who need to be moved on this, and and what are they going to? How are they going to be articulating the problems that they're facing? Because they're not, they're not going to articulate it on this policy level. They're going to articulate it in a very real world. I've got a problem, and and I need you to solve it. And until they hear that kind of language coming out of real people and from real places, uh, it's too abstract for them to to uh, build any. Uh, political will on it. So how, how do we activate those voices and what should, what kind of problems can be stated in a, in a real world way? So I actually think that um, that's one of the silver linings in the increasing crisis and the increased number of people who are cost burdened. Um, and that is an increased awareness of the problem, right? Where we're seeing, you know, in a lot of communities or some of the higher cost cities where the majority of renters are either themselves struggling or know somebody well who is. And uh, you know, MacArthur put out a poll last week that showed that uh, I think it was 81% of respondents said that housing affordability is a problem, and 76% said we need the federal government to do more. And that was across party lines. It was like 62% of Republicans and 88% of Democrats who said that we need the federal government to do more. So I think that increased awareness ultimately translates into increased political will. And we're seeing, um, you know, and, and, and to your point, that's what's most needed, right? We don't, we don't, we don't lack uh, an understanding of the problem. We don't lack solutions. We lack the political will to make the investment at the scale needed to solve the problem. And, um, and I think we are starting to see a shift there. We're seeing um, efforts on the Hill to increase the National Housing Trust Fund, to increase the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. We're seeing, um, bipartisan proposals put forward to expand the Section 8 voucher program to the extent that it would become an entitlement for the lowest income people. That's a bipartisan proposal. Uh, the administration put forward an $11 billion request to end family homelessness. So this, this increased uh, awareness of the problem and an increased willingness, I think, to not shy away uh, from the costs of solving this problem is ultimately what's going what's gonna to get us to the solutions. Can I jump in? Please. That, um, so two things. I think I think there are two um, good indicators, positive indicators. Um, I think that within the last year, through uh, this presidential campaign, uh, the issue of income inequality has been on the forefront. Whether you're a Republican or Democrat, um, there have been different solutions that are put forth. But I think the vo voters are speaking loudly through the voting booth that uh, the old playbook isn't working. Um, lack of investment isn't working. Uh, so I think that's one. The second thing, uh, not to pat the mayors on, the, on our back, but I want to do it for a second. Uh, in the last uh, five or six years, there's been a real recognition that, that mayors um, have uh, innovative solutions. They're closest to the ground, and they're making things happen with the resources that they have. A lot of my colleagues out there um, are actually ahead of the curve on policy, ahead of the federal government on policy. Um, in major cities and small cities. I see them all the time. One of the things I'm going to do, I'm, tomorrow I'm going to Indianapolis at the U.S. Conference of Mayors annual meeting. Um, I chair the committee on housing. As I said, Chris is going to be there with me. Uh, one of the uh, assignments I'm going to have for the mayors uh, is uh, what the next president needs to know about housing and community development. And a lot of what we've talked about today um, is going to be part of our agenda uh, when we get into the window. Whoever wins the presidency, I, I'm a partisan. I don't want to bring that into this. Uh, uh, may the best woman win. Uh, but uh, <laughs> look, you know, I think, I, I think there's a real window, and that's my third point. Um, w if we can, 
continue. A lot of our mayors have been very active through the U.S. Conference of Mayors um, and with the Obama administration, and, and fact, frankly, impacting policy, some of the policies that you mentioned, including myself, we've had a real effect. I think uh, the combination between this election, Senate election, congressional election, if we can activate mayors, other organizations, to actually, actually work together and not silo ourselves, transportation versus housing, social, versus, social services versus transportation, and recognize it's about people and investment in people, and there needs to be national investment together, I think we have a window of opportunity here. I would just note that housing has been conspicuously absent from the presidential contest entirely, right from the debates on on through now. Well, we're going to we, be making a lot of noise here down, a lot, okay, down the good. stretch. Uh, uh, we, in there, I think that's it's certainly not being talked about to the extent that it needs to be. But there have been some efforts that I think have been successful to elevate the issue, and probably more in this election than any we've ever seen where it's mentioned at all. Where uh, and the Terwilliger Foundation has done a lot of really good work on that, on um, engaging uh, candidates to talk about the need for affordable housing. And back just a few months ago, right before the the New York um, primary. The, a group of advocates, including the National Income Housing Coalition and a few city council members in New York City reached out to all the candidates to ask them to talk about their affordable housing solutions and to go visit New York City public housing. And I think maybe for the first time in presidential election history, uh, two of the candidates, Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton, each did go visit uh, New York City public housing and talk with the residents and put forward some solutions. So although I absolutely agree it's not to the extent it needs to be. Um, it has been talked about, I think, more than previous elections. We have a very, very short window of time. If you could be quick, we'll get one last question in. Can do. Uh, David Lipsetz, Associate Administrator for Rural Housing at U.S. Department of Agriculture. Thank you. Uh, this point last year, we stood together and talked about your report and agreed that there was a need for a more fulsome analysis of what happens in a rural geography, which rarely happens. Your report includes it. Thank you very much. Our programs are quite large. We have several billion dollars of uh, programming uh, pointed toward the families who are the most needy in rural geography, and all of our programs are means tested. So I guess the question would be then if we're looking at policy moving forward, would everything from uh, what happens with a mortgage to the rent that you pay at the end of the day be a means tested uh, program in your views of comprehensive uh, housing policy? I guess we could start at the end and well, move our really way forward. Well, we only have a minute left. Do you, does that, uh, someone feel strongly they should, in that? they should be means tested? Yes. Um, I'm asking you if you think it's a point of public policy that we should means test our housing programs as all of those at USDA are. Uh, well, I mean, I think that to the extent that we have limited subsidy dollars, that there are certain ways we spend our money should be means tested. Uh, but I think we need a policy that goes across a broad spectrum. And we need to add housing. Uh, pretty broadly, and so if not, I think if we're going to have a comprehensive policy, there's a place for some means tested and a place for others as well. I don't know, Stuart, if you had. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know how to weigh in on specifically that, but the one thing I'll say is if, if, if our total focus on housing policy is in and around subsidies, uh, whether they're federal or local, um, there's something in, in this city that's called gridlock that seems to be activated. I think we've got to bring in our private institutions as well into this discussion, and comprehensive housing policy should be a whole approach. Uh, we still have a mortgage business that is primarily government driven and is the subject of a lot of discussion. And Diana, I think you're absolutely right. Missing from the discourse in this presidential election, but across the country, has been a discussion around housing, the whole policy and what we think is missing, because uh, what we are driving towards at the production levels that we're, we're at right now is higher demand or higher need at all levels and lower supply relative to a growing population. And that means that prices get, keep, keep getting pushed up. So cities like Newton, where prices are already high, get higher because it's more desirable location. And the poor and middle class keeps getting disenfranchised and pushed out. We better have a policy around this where we're going to keep pushing people out and have less, 
housing available. And see how he brought that perfectly back to prices right where we started. I'd like to thank the panel so much, all of our esteemed panelists and all of you for coming. I'd like to uh, give a last shout out to the Ford Foundation, to the Policy Advisory Board of the Joint Center, and to a number of organizations here in the room who were sponsors of the report. We're, we're grateful for your support. Very big thank you to Diana. You did a fabulous job. Thank you for joining us. And our panelists, uh, I think what we're trying to do is jumpstart a national conversation about the importance of housing and the fact that we need to do something about it. And I think having all these different perspectives has been enormously helpful. So thank you all. And read the report and spread the word. Thank you. <laughs>